this material, I wanted to present a little bit of my own research and to try and make it relevant to some of the themes that we've been discussing in the, in the course. And the two things in particular that I want to connect are um, the discussions that we've had about the nature of, the nature of thoughts and also the nature of what people sometimes call mind reading, or what we've been calling psicología de sentido común. So I want to do, just in time, so I want to do some, I want to do three, three main things. Y tenemos handouts también. So I want to make some distinctions. This is my favorite activity, and I think it's probably the most important thing that, that we can do as, as philosophers in thinking about, particularly about experimental evidence. Experimentalists draw theoretical conclusions from data, but generally speaking, they're not very good at it. What we can bring to the, to the table is a more subtle understanding of the different possible positions. And to make sure that the conclusions that people draw from their experiments are indeed, indeed um, established by them. So there are some important distinctions to be made between different types of folk psychology, between different types of mind reading. And the first one that I want to make is between what I'm going to call minimal mind reading and substantive mind reading. And I also want to make a distinction between propositional attitude mind reading and perceptual mind reading. One of the things that we've been talking about a lot in the course is the importance of propositional attitude mind reading in understanding social coordination. This idea that we find, for example, in David Lewis, we looked at last week, that all, almost all human social interaction depends upon our propositional attitude psychology. And I want to say a little bit about how we can, why that's not necessarily true, that there are alternatives to propositional attitude mind reading in making sense of human coordination and social understanding. And I want to do this because I, it seems to me that there are reasons to think that propositional attitude mind reading is language dependent. And so it's not something that we were going to find in the animal kingdom. But as just emerged from the presentation just now, Animals are not stupid. There are lots of intelligent behaviors that we can discover. The question is not, are animals intelligent, but how do we understand their intelligence? And the idea that I want to get across, one of the ideas that I want to get across, is that we can understand animals as being very psychologically intelligent without thinking that they're capable of propositional attitude mind reading. So I think that a lot of the discussion that we've already had today has been too, has been very black and white. Are animals capable of thinking? Are they not capable of thinking? Are they intelligent? Are they not intelligent? Are they stimulus response creatures or not stimulus response creatures? It seems to me that there are many different levels of intelligence that we can take into account and use to think about animal behavior. So let me start by talking about what I want to call minimal mind reading. And this is something that we find in the animal kingdom. And I, I, I prepared this talk to <coughs> give to um, the Center for the Study of Evolution in Leipzig, uh, run by Michael, Michael Tomasello, who was mentioned earlier, earlier today. So I was focusing particularly on animals. But minimal mind reading we find also in humans. But it's basically forms of social coordination that involve sensitivity to the psychological states of other participants. 
Just sensitivity. This is very, a very neutral word. Mm -hmm. I want to start as neutral as possible and then make it more specific. But it's not completely, it's neutral, but it's not empty. Okay? So there are two things that we might want to distinguish it from. There are lots of examples of psychological sensitivity that don't involve social coordination. So for example, if you look at a flock of birds, you often see um, the emotion of fear spread through it as they all take off. What we get is an emotional contagion, psychological sensitivity, sensitivity to the psychological states of other participants. But there's no coordination. There's just a, there just happens to be collective action without coordination. And there are lots of examples of social coordination without psychological sensitivity. So when I gave this talk in, in, in Leipzig, one of, the, one of the researchers there gave me a very nice example of this, which I will share with you, particularly since Rodrigo has always been talking about crows. So you're obsessed with crows. Well, your dreams are just about to come true if I can make this work. So this, I want this, this is an example of sophisticated social coordination in crows. But, and it's very impressive. But the point I want to extract from it is this is social coordination without, that we can explain, we can understand, without thinking that it involves any social, without thinking that it involves any psychological sensitivity. Oops. Oh. How do I make it work? I click on this. You see. So what we have is a coordinated behavior. And what both crows in some sense understand is that they can't achieve their goal unless they coordinate their behaviors, unless they both, both pull the string at the same time. But it seems to me that the crows are not acting. We, in understanding what they're doing, we don't need to think that they are sensitive to to each other's psychological states. There's no mind reading going on here. This is much more an example of understanding of the physical world, or what people sometimes call naive physics, or folk physics. So, it's not yet what I want to call minimal mind reading. Minimal mind reading requires both psychological sensitivity and social coordination. So I think that there are some nicer examples of minimal mind reading in some experiments also done by researchers in, in, in Leipzig, actually, on, mm -hmm. with dogs. And these were, um, were much discussed um, a few years ago. So what's interesting about these experiments is that The, never mind. What the an experimenter has two two boxes, and there's food hidden in one of the boxes, and the aim of the dog, what the dog's aim obviously is to get the food, and what the experimenter does is signal the presence of signal which box the food is in, and they do this with a range of different cues. So they can look at the box that's got the food in it. Or they can point to the box that's got the food in it. Or they can shake the box that's got some food in it. They can nod their heads towards it. All sorts of different, different cues. And what happens is that the dogs are very good at, um, at detecting at detecting the, uh, the presence of the food. 
So what they're capable of is responding to different cues. And these cues all have a common cause. They're all caused by the same thing. They're caused by the, by the experimenter's psychological state. The experimenter intends to signal the location of the, award, of the, of the reward, of the food. And the dogs are sensible to this, are sensitive to it. They can, they can understand it. They can, they can act in accordance with it. But what I want to say about this is also that they can do this without representing the psychological state. So what we have here is a type of social coordination. The experimenter and the dog coordinate so that the dog gets the reward. But the dog is not necessarily representing the psychological state of the experiment. The dogs are sensitive to it, but they don't have to be representative. representative. So the notion of minimal mind reading that I want to use is quasi-operational. It's quasi-operational in the sense that, as far as the dog is concerned, it discusses only the dog's behavior. So an operational understanding of something is something that makes reference only to behavior. But this is quasi-operational because in understanding what's going on, we need to make a reference to the experimenter's psychological state, but not to the dog's representation of it. As far as the dog's concerned in minimal mind reading, we only have behavior. But what gives this behavior purpose and point is the psychology of the experiment. So here's the definition of minimal mind reading. So a creature, let's say it's an animal, it could be an, a human animal. A creature engages in minimal mind reading when its behavior depends systematically upon changes in the psychological states of other participants in the interaction. So this is what happens with the dog. The dog behaves in certain ways that depend upon the experimenter's psychological state. Because what the dog what the dog does is always go towards the box that the director, that the experimenter intends the dog to go to. So there's a dependence on the on the experimenter's psychological state. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, when you say that uh, the dog uh, can re respond to the uh, to the cues that are uh, exhibited by the investigator, uh, you 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 can infer that uh, by that uh, behavior, the dog <coughs> has some sense of the intention of the of the investigator. Yes. No. Uh, some sense. No. Sensitivity. Sensitivity, maybe. Uh, and uh, so uh, you uh, you are talking uh, that the dog uh, is conscious of uh, that his behavior uh, is uh, leading in that in that direction. So he <coughs> this is like a, a, a an automatically response to a stimulus. Well, it's not an automatic response to a stimulus, but it's acting in a way that acting in a way that reflects or is sensitive to the common cause of lots of different stimuluses. But it could just be stimulus response after all. So I make a movement and you go there and you find food. I make another movement and you go there and you find food. Pretty soon you think, if I follow this guy's movements, I'm going to find food every time. Now that doesn't require representing my intentional state, but nonetheless you're sensitive to my intentional state because where I'm pointing is caused by my intentional state. So there's a common cause for those things that is in psychology. 
And the dog is sensitive to the commonalities at the level of behavior, but not necessarily to the psychological cause. Uh, but, uh, maybe this can be explained in, uh, by a stimulus, uh, stimulus and response way. You can say that uh, the dog uh, sees that uh, each movement that you make uh, in, in some way is associated with food. So uh, he predicts that the next movement will be associated by food. Maybe. This is not actually explaining anything. This is simply describing a behavior. So you're talking about minimal mind reading? Yes. That's just a name that I'm using to characterize some behaviors. Behaviors that have two characteristics. The first one is that they involve social coordination. And the second is that they involve psychological sensitivity. Understood in this operational way. Yes. So the point that the, the point that I want to get across is the distinction between minimal mind reading and substantive mind reading. So substantive mind reading takes place when you have behavior that depends systematically on how a creature represents the psychological states of other um, other participants in the interaction. Now. This is a description, and this is an explanation. There are, as Bernardo has just pointed out, there, are many, there may be things that fall under this description that don't require this sort of explanation. I just find it helpful to keep those two things apart because it's tempting whenever you see something that fits, behavior that fits this sort of bill, it fits this sort of description to interpret it in this very rich sense. And I think that we should fight against that. <coughs> we should fight against that temptation. We should resist it. Uh, uh, Will. In minimum by reading, do you uh, mean that the uh, experimenters at least have a right of state? Yes. So <coughs> I'm, here I am, a third person, and I'm describing the situation. And I make reference to the, the a mental state, the mental state of the experiment. But the minimal mind reading is taking place, I'm really interested in the dog, and I'm not talking about the dog's mental states. But if I was, in, if I was saying that the dog was engaged in substantive mind reading, I would be talking about the dog's mental states. Because I would be saying that the dog <coughs> is representing the intentions of the experiment. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Okay, so sorry, so this is what... Um, so the, ne the next thing I want to say is that substantive mind reading comes in two types. So this is already a very rich accomplishment, but we can understand it in two different ways. There are two different types of mind reading that are going on, and this is crucially important for what I want to get across. On the one hand, we have perceptual mind reading, which involves representing the perceptual states of another creature. Or we have propositional attitude mind reading, which involves representing propositional attitudes, beliefs or desires or intentions. Now, just to jump ahead a little bit, it seems to me, and it seems to other people who, to, who, to some other people who've studied the experimental literature on animal cognition, that all examples of animal cognition come over here. That there's no propositional attitude mind reading in the, in the animal kingdom. So Povinelli certainly takes that view, but it's also the case that Tomasello takes that view, takes that view as well. In fact, there are very few people who think that propositional attitude takes place in the mind dream, in the, in the animal kingdom. And that was why in the context of Bernardo's presentation earlier, I was asking him about which types of thinking were going on. What sort of representations do you need to attribute? And I had particularly in mind, do you need to attribute propositional attitude mind reading to explain the social behavior of chimpanzees, or can you do it in terms of perceptual? 
But anyway, both perceptual mind reading and propositional attitude mind reading are types of substantive mind reading. And substantive mind reading is a type of minimal mind reading, and minimal mind reading involves both social coordination and psychological sensitivity. The point of this diagram is that the arrows all go this way. They don't go this way. So just because you've got evidence of psychological sensitivity, you can't automatically conclude that you've got propositional attitude mind reading, for example. So the point that I want to make is that you can observe lots of behaviors, but there are many different levels of sophistication in which you can interpret. And these, I think these levels often get uh, run together in, in discussions of, uh, of experiments. So, <coughs> let me try and bring out why I think that this distinction between propositional attitude mind reading and perceptual mind reading is important. And I just want to go back to start thinking not about propositional attitude psychology or mind reading, but just about behavior and the psychological explanation of behavior. Because this is really something that we've been talking about since six o'clock, well, since 20 past six last Monday. And when we started out, we started out talking about Davidson. And one of Davidson's big ideas that we talked about was the idea of the holism of the mental. And at the heart of it is this simple idea that's on the board. Psychological states don't generate behavior on their own. We need to think of the way in which psychology, particular psychological states, cause behavior is a function of an agent's complete psychological background. So we saw this particularly in the discussion of Davidson. Davidson's argument for the anomalism of the mental depends upon the idea that there are indefinitely many defeaters. There are indefinitely many defeaters because there are indefinitely many different possible psychological profiles. So the belief and desires that might cause behavior relative to one background psychological profile won't necessarily cause the same behavior relative to another background psychological profile. Okay, but this comes in degrees, right? Some psychological states have very direct implications for action, and some feed into action only very indirectly. And it's going to turn out that the ones that are here look like perceptual states. And the ones that are down here tend to be propositional attitudes. So let me, let me bring out why I think that's important. <coughs> Suppose you're thinking about how you understand another person's behavior in terms of their psychology. It's not going to be enough simply to represent particular psychological states. Because particular psychological states depend upon all this background. So you're gonna, there's going to need to be something else if your representation of particular psychological states is going to be effective in predicting or explaining a particular behavior. In particular, it's going to have to be the case that the predictions that you make are in conformity with the agent's background psychological profile. Now notice this expression, in conformity with. All I mean by that is that they've got to agree with each other. They've got to line up the right way. The interesting question is going to be, how do we get them to line up? And this is going to be where the distinction between perceptual mind reading and propositional attitude mind reading becomes really important. What do I mean by them being in conformity? Well, I mean that the predictive behavior... So, here's a normal human being. 
who believes that it's raining and doesn't want to get wet. So I assume that they will go outside with their umbrella. For that prediction to work, it's got to be the case that that person's background psychological profile is such that if they don't want to get wet, they will take an umbrella with them. So for example, they don't believe that rain comes upwards rather than downwards. So the, the background psychological profile has to be lined up. The prediction has to be appropriately lined up with the background psychological profile. <coughs> okay, so how do you get conformity with the background psychological profile? Here are at least two ways of doing it. You can explicitly represent the whole of the psychology. So I can represent the person's desires not to get wet. They believe that it's raining. They believe that rain goes downwards, not upwards. They believe that umbrellas are impermeable to water, and so on and so forth. And then I can use general principles that connect psychology and behavior. Or I can assume, I can trade on some stereotypes in people's behavior. Now, the way in which this is going to work, so what I'm going to say is that propositional attitude mind reading requires explicit representation. Perceptual mind reading usually requires simply being able to trade on generic and common background psychological profile. So propositional attitude mind reading is going to come out as a much more a much more straightforward intellectual achievement. Any any questions on the general lie of the land up to now? Clear? True? Well, we'll see. Okay, good. 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 That's what I like. <coughs> okay. So here's a basic principle about <coughs> explicit representation about the first of the two options. The more different people are, the more you're going to need to go into the background of the psychological profile. And so if you're trying to explain their behavior with reference to psychological states, the more you need to explicitly to represent how an agent might reason their way to a conclusion. The more, the more individual someone is, the more you need to recreate their own practical reasoning in trying to make sense of them. And the principle of the holism of the mental that we've discussed in the context of Davidson and other people might be put in this way. Propositional attitude mind reading always requires explicit representation and explicit reasoning. There's no simple rules that will take you from particular beliefs and particular actions to, to particular actions because the belief only leads to the action relative to some sets of some background psychological profiles but not relative to others. So propositional attitude mind reading is going to be complicated. It's going to be complicated for the following reasons. It's going to certainly require attributing propositional attitudes. It's also going to require explicitly representing the agent's background psychological profile. And it's also going to require reasoning about how these two things, some particular propositional attitudes and a particular psychological profile, 
might lead to action. So really this is turning out to be quite a um, sophisticated intellectual achievement. And those of you who came to the talk I gave here, here, in this very room, um, whenever it was, last, last skiing season, August I guess it must have been, may remember that I had this argument that logical reasoning is language dependent. And the version of the argument that I want to give today, if we have time, is that propositional attitude mind reading is going to be mind dependent because this sort of stuff requires explicit representation of logical relations. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that. For the, for the moment, let me just contrast propositional attitude mind reading with perceptual mind reading. <coughs> which need not require explicit representation of the background psychological profile or explicit reasoning. <coughs> so suppose I see a hundred dollar bill on the ground and I see someone see it. I will immediately predict that they will bend over to pick it up because it's just standard bit of human psychology that they prefer free money to no money. This is not going to work if it's propositional attitude mind reading. If I just know that someone believes that there's money on the, on the ground, that's not enough for me to know, for me to instantly to, to say that they, they, um, that they will bend over to pick it up. I need to also to attribute to them a whole bunch of other beliefs. The beliefs, for example, that the money's within, within reach, that it's visible, that the place where they believe it to be is the place right in front of them that's within reach. All those other beliefs need to be brought into play. But if they're just standing there looking at it, all those beliefs can obviously be taken for granted. So my propositional attitude, mind reading, is much simpler. And what I'm, what I'm doing, and what propositional attitude mind reading in general is doing, is training on direct connections between perception and action. There are lots of direct connections between perceptions and actions. If I see a predator, I usually free, uh, flee, flee. <laughs> if I see food, and I'm thinking, remember I'm thinking about animals here, if I see food, I will go and get it. If I see a potential mate, well, we won't, we won't go there. <laughs> so there are predictable responses to seeing a predator or a food source. So what I want, perceptual mind reading could be a much simpler, a much simpler activity than propositional attitude mind reading. It doesn't require all this background stuff. It doesn't require thinking about how beliefs might feed into action. It doesn't require representing background psychological profiles. It's a different type of intellectual achievement. Okay, so, so what I've talked about is a basic distinction between minimal mind reading and substantive mind reading, and propositional attitude mind reading versus perceptual mind reading. So suppose that you're giving a presentation, for example, on language and thought, and you say, it's well known that um, chimpanzees are capable of complicated forms of cognitive, of social cognition, which shows that they are mind readers. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't say that, but you could have said it. So what I want to get across is the idea, well, if you're going to say that, then first you need to convince me that there's minimal mind reading going on at all not just behavior like the ravens. Then you need to convince me that there's substantive mind reading, not just minimal <coughs> mind reading like the dogs. Then you need to convince me that there's propositional attitude mind reading going on, not simply perceptual mind reading. So the move that takes you from social coordination in chimpanzees to chimpanzee theory of mind is, involves several different argumentative steps. That's all that I know. That's my major take home message here. Okay, so 
there are some, some distinctions. So what about human social coordination? So one reason for thinking that animals are capable of sophisticated types of social cognition is the thought that, well, animals do lots of things that are similar to the things that we do, and we do those things by using propositional attitude psychology. So that's the way that animals solve them. So there's kind of a double analogy, I think, in thinking about non-linguistic mind reading. The first analogy is between the types of social situation confronted by humans and non-human animals. And the second analogy is between the strategies that are used to navigate those situations by humans and non-humans. So, we can turn this analogy on its head. We can sort of run it in reverse, as it were. We can apply the well-known principle of one man's modus ponens is another man's modus tollens that was discussed several times last, um, last week. Because the standard ways of applying this double analogy stress the centrality of propositional attitude mind reading in human social life. And we've seen examples of this. We saw examples of this in the context of uh, Lewis, for example. And we'll see another example in but suppose instead that you can show, well, actually, this is exaggerated. Propositional attitude mind reading is not as dominant as people think it is. Then if you do that, then it becomes much less plausible to think that there's a propositional attitude mind reading. It weakens the case <coughs> for propositional attitude mind reading in the animal kingdom. So we've already seen one way, one way of doing this. Can anyone remember what that, what that was? Showing that complicated, relatively complicated forms of social understanding that are standardly interpreted in terms of propositional attitude psychology can actually be understood in similar, similar simpler terms. Simulation. The simulation theory, that's exactly right. So that was that was the that was the inter well, one of the interesting things about Gordon's paper. So Gordon's paper discusses the false belief task, the so-called false belief task. So there's something we have a behavior that is standardly interpreted as requiring propositional attitude mind reading. I can't solve the solve the false belief task, says Joseph Perner and a whole bunch of other people, unless I apply concepts of belief and desire. So Bob Gordon's idea, in contrast, is well, actually, it's much simpler than that. We just do some recentering. We think about how things might look to us if we were in that person's position. So when I say a philosopher's myth, I don't mean to imply in any sense that you should not think it's true. So here's the philosopher's myth. Trees and planets behave in relatively regular ways. When the wind blows, a tree moves in much the same way each time. Mars moves through the sky in a highly predictable way. By contrast, human beings move in a quite bewildering variety <coughs> of ways. Nevertheless, we often succeed in predicting what they will do. How do we do this? By treating them as subjects with mental states. By observing what they do and say, we arrive at views about what they're thinking, what they desire, and closely associated views about their characters, mental capacities, and in general, about their psychological profiles. We then, in terms of those profiles, predict what they will do. So here's a very clear statement of the view that we also find in David Lewis. Human beings are so complicated and we also find in the photo, for example, at the, at the beginning of the persistence of the attitudes that we read last, last week. 
human beings are so complicated, we couldn't get any handle on it unless we were thinking in terms of the concepts of propositional attitude psychology. Without concepts of belief and desire, the human social world would be opaque to us. We wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to survive. I call it a myth, of course, because it's false. So if you wanted to undermine the myth, powerful though it is, then a good way to do it would be to find ways of modeling social interaction and social coordination that don't involve propositional attitude, mind you. Just take things that seem on the face of it to be complex psychological achievements and try and give alternative and simpler explanations. So I'm just going to talk about two examples. So one of them we actually talked about, we talked about yesterday um, in the context of the massive modularity myth. Well, massive modularity hypothesis. And this is the indefinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma situation. But I also want to talk about frame-based reasoning in routine interactions. And these are, these are both nice because they give us a way, this one gives us a way of thinking about some things that were mentioned earlier today. Vervet monkey communication behavior, which is often put forward as an example of, of, of sophisticated social cognition in the animal world. <coughs> and also tactical deception in primates, which is again often put forward by people who think that there's a theory of mind in, in, in primates. <coughs> and kind of Bernardo alluded to, alluded to both of those in, in, his, in his talk. Uh, you alluded both to vervet monkeys and to Deception in primates. Monos, los monos. No, los monos son son los verdes. Pero los, well, actually, they were baboons. Well, we'll see. We'll see. You'll recognise it. Okay. So the iterator prisoner's dilemma. <coughs> we don't need to say very much about this. We saw yesterday that defection is the dominant strategy in one-player games. It's also the dominant strategy when you know how many times you're playing the game. So it's a well-known argument called the backwards induction argument. If you know what it is, then that's fine if you don't. Look at But as I pointed out yesterday, when the number of iterations is not known, the strategy that you should play over time depends upon how likely it is that the other player is cooperate and the likelihood of encountering that player again. Okay, so yesterday when we were talking about this, we talked about the way in which this was interpreted by Cosmides and Tubi in support of the massive modularity hypothesis. So the idea was that, their idea is that this only works if we have a cheetah detection module. But I want to draw a slightly different, a slightly different lesson from it. So here are two ways of applying tip for tap. So tip for tap <coughs> Okay, so there are two strategies. There's the, the mind reading strategy. So wait a minute, so let me back up. So we need to work out the likelihood that the other player is a cooperator. This is a fact about the other player's psychology. Psychological, it's a psychological trait. It depends upon their beliefs and their intentions and so on. So how do you apply it? How do you work out the utility of the strategy? Well, you need to... It's one way of thinking that you work out this out by engaging in psychology and trying to work out whether the person is a cooperator. So you might adopt what I call the mind-reading strategy. You might assess the other player's character and expectations. You might try to influence her assessment of your character and expectations. You might make yourself out to be a nice guy when you're, when you're not, or the other way around. No, you wouldn't want to do that. Or you might adopt what we talked about yesterday, which was the heuristic strategy. 
you might just adopt a simple rule, tit for tat, or tit for two tats, as we said. Now, the point about this is that it's not based on predictions about how other people will behave. It's not based on assessments of their character. It's not based on psychology at all. It's an example of behavior reading, not an example of mind reading. So we know what tip for tat is. But in this, in this book by Axelrod that I, that I mentioned yesterday, he synthesizes a number of empirical studies that have shown or have well, what they've shown is how you can use tit for tat to illuminate or to model many complex human interactions, including interactions between French and German troops during the First World War and patterns of alliances, sorry about that spelling mistake, in the, in the United States Senate. So amongst the many ideas that he tries to get across is thought this very simple heuristic can be used to predict and to make sense of incredibly complex, sophisticated types of social interaction. And suppose it's the case, you know, I'm not a sociologist, thank God, so I don't have to make any speculations about what's going on in these sorts of situations. But suppose it's the case that Axel Rod is right. Suppose it's the case that these sorts of things might come about through people simply applying tip for tap type heuristics without engaging in complex forms of propositional attitude mind reading. Then we certainly would have examples of how these very complex social interactions can take place without any propositional attitude mind reading. So this would weaken the case, I think. This would weaken the hold that propositional attitude mind reading might have on on you as well. It might weaken What's it going to weaken? It's going to weaken your sense that propositional attitude mind reading is indispensable for social coordination, social interaction, social understanding. Okay, so I like frame-based systems in, in AI as well. So these came about partly as in response to the frame problem in the late 1970s, I guess, and early, early, early 80s. The idea was that people weren't having much success writing programs that would have sort of common knowledge databases in and that could integrate, draw on these knowledge databases to solve problems. So the alternative idea was to write programs that used very simple templates for routine actions and just allowed those templates to be modified to fit particular circumstances. So Minsky was a, a big guy in this. So here's Minsky on the subject. Here's the essence of the theory. When one encounters a new situation, or makes a substantial change in one's view of the present problem, one selects from memory a structure called a frame. This is a remembered framework to be adapted to fit reality by changing details as necessary. A frame is a data structure for representing a stereotype situation, like being in a certain kind of living room, or going to a child's birthday party, or seeing a leopard and alerting the other vertebrate monkeys. Attached to each frame are several kinds of information. Some of this information is about how to use the frame. Some is about what one can expect to happen next. Some is about what to do if these expectations are not confirmed. So he continues. We can think of a frame as a network of nodes and relations. The top levels of a frame are fixed. They represent things that are always true about the supposed situation. Whenever there's a child's birthday party, there's certainly a birthday. But it depends. You know, it could be the second birthday, it could be the third, it could be the 14th, who knows? And the, so that's where the lower levels come in. These have many terminals slots that must be fitted in, that must be filled in by specific instances or data. So where you set the parameters 
So this is a fourth birthday party. Each terminal can specify the conditions its assignments must meet. If it's the children's birthday party, then 27 is not an acceptable, an acceptable assignment. Simple conditions are specified by markers that might require a terminal assignment to be a person, an object of sufficient value, or a pointer to a subframe of a certain type. More complex conditions can specify relations amongst the things assigned to several terminals. So the idea here is that instead of trying to, to, there are lots of social situations that we don't try and solve from scratch. We have routines that solve them, and we just adapt the routines to fit the specific, to, spit, to fit the specific cases. So why is this interesting here? Well, one reason it's interesting is that the parameters for the frames don't have to be proposition latitude attributions. So I might have an interaction frame. I might have my restaurant frame, for example. So I go to the restaurant, I order my meal at every stage, it's clear what's, what's happening. And I'm just setting the parameters, and I'm following the frame. If you're Jackson, who we looked at before, what's going on? I'm interpreting the person coming towards me. I'm thinking, he believes that I'm a customer. He desires to receive my order. He believes that blah, 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 blah. And the frame gives us another way of thinking about it, where you don't need to go through all the propositional attitude stuff. So they can be purely behavioral, or they can just be set by perceptual mind reading. I can just see that the waiter sees me. If I see that the waiter sees me, then I can attract his attention and ask for the bill. I don't need to think, well, if he sees me making this gesture, then he will believe that I desire to have the bill. He you know, so. <coughs> so this way of thinking about things I think is interesting because it gives us a way of thinking about some of this observational data sometimes cited as evidence of propositional attitude mind reading in primates. Now you need to know a little bit of background here. So the social intelligence hypothesis or the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis was put forward by Byrne and Whiteman as a result of their study of a database of observations of primates. So they basically just <coughs> compiled lots of anecdotal reports of how people had observed primates in the wild and tried to categorize them into groups. And then, drew then just drew conclusions from that. They said, well, you can't, you know, we need to interpret these in terms of propositional attitude mind reading. They didn't use those terms, but that's what they did. But I think the frames-based approach provides another way of thinking about it. And what I want to stress is that this, the, the data that we've got are just observations. They're just people out, tourists, not tourists, they're, you know, well, they, they are tourists, they're academic tourists. But they're just writing down what they see. They're, these are not controlled experiments. This is not, this is not science in Sorry. any shape or form. Uh, I can't see clearly the difference between the, the behavioral response and the perceptual mind reading. For example, uh, in, in the example that you did uh, about the, the man that uh, thinks that uh, it's raining, mm -hmm. so um, you, you can uh, make the inference that he's going to take his umbrella. And that was an, an example of perceptual mind reading. That was an example actually of propositional attitude mind reading. Uh, yes. Uh, but uh, you said that uh, Sometimes you can make that inference without propositional representation. No, what I said was that sometimes you all you need is to that if you're making an inference from propositional attitudes, you need to represent background psychology. But often when you're just simply representing perceptual states, you don't need to do that. Can you give a, a, an example to say about the uh, perceptual mind reading in humans? Perceptual mind reading in humans? Sure. Um, I see that the waiter sees me. Um, and, uh, Which is different from I attribute to the waiter the belief that I am here. But that can be behavioral. That you see that when people see you, sees you with, true. That, with that face, it's always true. they take care of it. It's true. And so there's a very interesting discussion, again, 
involving people from Michael Tomasello's lab about how we understand apparent perceptual mind reading in primates. Do we understand it as real perceptual mind reading or do we understand it as sensitivity to eye gaze? To the direction in which the eyes are. There are some experiments which uh, show that they, they tend to... You're too quick with your experiments. The, 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 there are some experiments that are being very much discussed in precisely that, in precisely that way. I have some comments on the Raven example, but I'm, I'm going to just keep it so that you gain more speed. And no, that, well, that's all right. But so the experiments that you're thinking of are the ones <coughs> where the... Um, I think these are the experiments you're thinking of. I can't... I'm not going to launch out into some massive proposition last you mind reading here. I'm just going to, <laughs> I'm going to just use a, a quick and dirty heuristic, which is probably the, this is what you're thinking of. So the ones where we have... Um, dominant chimpanzee alpha and a less dominant chimpanzee beta. And food is put somewhere in the, on the um, subdominant chimpanzee's side of this enclosure. And what, uh, what these guys had Tomasello and Cole found in a well-known paper in 2001 was that the subdominant chimpanzee would often get, would tend to get the food when in situations where the alpha male couldn't see it. Okay? So then, but now, the reason I say that these are hotly debated is because, so how exactly do we interpret this? Do we interpret it as the subdominant chimpanzee can see where the chimpanzee is seeing, or do we interpret it the Subdominant chimpanzee can see that there is an obstacle, so that there is no continuous line of sight. And there's a very big difference between seeing that there is a continuous, seeing that there isn't a continuous line of sight, and seeing that um, and, and seeing that somebody is seeing. Are those the experiments you're thinking of? Yes, but I, I see, don't know why my quick and dirty heuristic work. Which, which they cover their their guest group buckets. That's a that's a that's a different experiment. That's Povinelli experiment. Povinelli and Eddie, 1996. Yeah. So the, the and this was trying to show that the chimps don't have any understanding even of eye gaze. Yes. So the idea was that it was kind of like the dog <coughs> thing. So you. The idea is that the chimpanzees don't discriminate between you when you're looking at them and when you're looking at something when you've got a bucket over your head. Yeah. So that the, the, anything to do with eye gaze makes no, makes no, um, makes no odds to them. Now, the, the way in which people think about... Those experiments are very important for shaking people's confidence in, <laughs> in, in overly, overly quick interpretations of what's going on in chimps. But a lot of people say that they don't really reveal much about chimpanzees' understanding of other chimps. Which is, so what we've got here, an understanding of the eye gaze possibly seeing of their conspecifics. Whereas we wouldn't, and that the, the skills that they may have there may not necessarily carry across to their understanding of experimenters. So there's an interesting follow-up to this story, which is that um, it turns out that Chimps are better on the bucket task if they have been enculturated, if they've been exposed to if they've been exposed to humans for long periods of time. So the, the, that started off some research into um, into the differences between enculturated and non-enculturated chimps, and, and as yet unresolved. Okay, well I've got one minute left. So I'm, I'm not going to go into the third part, and anyway, I've presented more or less the, the, a similar a version of that argument here already. So I just want to talk about communication and tactical deception. So let's consider everyone's favorite examples of, of um, 
communication in primates, which are verbal monkey alarm calls. And we know what they are. They're relatively fixed responses. So when the vervet sees, a, sees a, a leopard, they make one call. When they see an eagle, they make another call. And when they see a, a what's the other one? A snake. It's a snake. That's it. That's it. They see, they make a third call. Now, these are all pretty fixed responses. The call itself is a fixed response, and so is the way in which other vervets respond to it. And they're triggered by different perceptual experiences. But we can view all these, I think, as terminals in a in a frame. That there are just these complicated routines wired into vervet monkeys, but the parameters are set differently. So this is kind of like a more sophisticated type of innate releasing mechanism. One parameter, set the parameter, the parameters are set one way by seeing a leopard, set another way by seeing a snake, and the third way by seeing by seeing an eagle. So you can say that in a way that's compatible with saying that the alarm calls carry information. You don't, you're not saying, for example, that the alarm giving vervet monkey is simply um, communicating its distress, for example. It could, you, this sort of account is compatible with the idea that there really is some signaling going on here. There's communicative behavior. But no assumption that there's any attempt to manipulate the informational states of conspecifics. So there's a routine, and we're, we're all part of it. We, the community of Berbert monkeys, that we are just for the moment. So we all know the routine. We know what happens. We know how to behave when we see a leopard. We know how to behave when we hear the leopard, the leopard cry. There's a complicated signaling information transfer within, within that frame, but there's no sort of psychological, there's no mind reading going on. So tactical deception. Here are some more examples of line of sight type stuff. So Kuma. Um, there's a famous description of Kuma, who's um, well, it's an alpha male. It's a it's a subordinate male <coughs> who's grooming a female behind a rock, and the female moves in such a way, the alpha male moves in such a way that they are able to groom away without, um, in a way that exploits the existence of a rock blocking the line of sight between the, um, between the dominant male and the, the dominant male and the, um, and the alpha male. So from the alpha male's perspective, all the alpha male can see is a female baboon behind a rock. What Kuma can see from his vantage point is the female baboon grooming the subordinate male in the full knowledge that the full knowledge that the that the dominant chimp can't see what's going on. So this is really kind of the the in the wild version of of this sort of stuff. These experiments are ways to try and make these turn these observations into into something that looks like science. Again, we've got some terminals. So we've got the kind of the avoidance, the, the, the secret grooming, secret grooming frame that has terminals for perceptions of, perceptions of obstacles, that has terminals for alpha male's line of sight. So you can see the same frame being applied here. And those terminals fix and determine the possible movements relative to the obscured line of sight. Okay, so that's actually all I'm going to have time to do. But let me just sum up what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm trying to what I've tried to achieve. The, the bit in red is the bit that we're not going to get. So what I'm trying to what I've tried to show is that there are ways of thinking about proposition attitude mind reading in humans that don't so the ways of thinking about social coordination, social understanding in humans that don't involve propositional attitude mind reading. And that we can use those same alternatives to make sense of, of at least some examples that people have drawn conclusions from when it comes to non-linguistic creatures. <coughs>
And that's a good thing, because in the hidden part of the paper, the hidden units of my paper contain, the, contain an argument that propositional attitude mind reading is language dependent. So what I'm trying to do is to find an intermediate position that will allow, well, that will do justice to all the examples that we have of sophisticated cognition, sophisticated social cognition in animals, but we interpret them in a way that is consistent with my argument, which is that propositional attitude mind reading is language dependent. And the reason it comes out as being language dependent is that um, proposition attitude mind reading involves representing the reasoning that would lead a creature to behave in a certain way. And those representations require representing logical relations, and logical relations stand between things that have structure, and the only things that have the right sort of structure are linguistic. And there are some other bells and whistles in the argument, but that's the basic, that's the basic line. So I'm sorry I didn't have time to, to, to finish. But I have finished. That's the end. <laughs> <laughs>